guess we can resume. Leonardo had two lectures last week telling us about superconformal field theory, and he'll continue today to tell us more. Okay, thank you very much. Please interrupt me with questions. Last time I saw many of you in some sort of catatonic status, I couldn't tell whether it's <laughs> because <laughs> what I was talking about uh, didn't make any sense or just because of general, um, you know, I understand that you're getting tired, it's the last week. So I, I last time I inflicted upon you my favorite subject, which is the superconformal representation theory <laughs> of any <laughs> In any of, of n equal to two supersymmetry in four dimensions, and here is a short recap. <laughs> so um, I, um, for uh, not because I don't love the other multiples, but because I had to make a choice, I I chose to focus on the most uh, on the stringent shortening con most stringent shortening conditions. Uh, the multiple that come by imposing four simultaneous C-type condition, I see hat r equal to 0. The other time I actually uh, said something uh, incorrect. I also said that r different from 0 belongs to this class. That is not true. r different from 0 uh, belongs to this class only when 2, uh, uh, sorry, okay, so um, so, so this is what I really meant to say. One is imposing um, Sorry. Um, one is imposing fog. Okay, so I'm now getting a little bit. Uh, sorry. Um, sorry, and I'm now getting confused about something basic. But anyway, I'm not going to be able to to get this straight right now. There's probably a typo in the omelet black, but yes. Yes, I'm sorry. I was thinking about n equals to 4. OK. Thank you very much. That fixes my type. So, uh, so this is the shortening condition n equal to 2. Uh, and last time I, I stated that this is also true for big R different from 0. That is incorrect. R different from 0 is of this type, but where only 1c and 1c bar are imposed. If you impose the uh, maximal set of c and c bars, you find these multiplets. Uh, then there are the b and b bar type multiplets, which are the chiral multiplets, remember that this is the condition that says the Q1 alpha and Q2 alpha simultaneously annihilate the superconformal primaries, whereas this condition says the Q1 alpha and Q tilde 2 alpha dot annihilate the primary. So we made, uh, uh, and so of course here it's Q tilde 1 alpha dot Q tilde to alpha dot annihilate the primary, whereas the C condition was half as strong. Let no, I wrote it last time. Let me write it again. So we, um, unfortunately, okay, it took some time to develop this language, but now we can finally use to do some physics. And the theme will be, we we develop some experience with Lagrangian field theories, and that will be very valuable in giving a physical interpretation to the shortening condition. And then we will abstract. Uh, that intuition to something uh, more general and make certain abstract claims about how the presence of these multiplets uh, influence our understanding, I mean, in, uh, or, um, informs our understanding of the structure of the superconformal field theory. So first of all, let's start with the first type of multiplets. I said this the other time, but let me repeat it. Of these multiplets, the only one that has immediate physical interest for us is the one where we take the spins to be zero. This is the stress tensor multiplet. It's a general fact about superconformal field theories that the stress tensor comes in the same multiplet. In fact, it's the top component of a multiplet that also contains the supercurrents, the R currents. Let me write indices for, for, uh, for simplicity. These are the art symmetry currents. And in this particular case, but well this is just a special feature of n equal to 2, the bottom component of the multiple is a scalar of dimension 2. Um, on the other hand, multiplets for which one of the spins or both are different from 0, if 
j1, j2 is different from 0, uh, the multiple it contains necessarily a conserved higher spin current. And we disallow it because by this famous result of Malasen and Zhivoyedov, the presence of higher spin current, seen as the fact that there is a decoupled free subsetter in the theory, and we do not wish to talk about such scenarios. Now, um, the 2 and 3 point function of the stress tensors, as was reviewed by Ken Trigreto last week, encode the vial, uh, the trace anomaly of the theory. And so, um, if we imagine we are given the theory as an abstract list of operator representations and their 2 and 3 point functions, from knowledge of the 2 and 3 point function of this multiple, we can read off the anomaly. So A and C, which I'm not going to write again, can be the last week, are encoded in the two and three point functions of this multiple, in particular of the immunity. But, but because of super conformal symmetry, of course, also the two and three point function of the arc currents, for example, depend on A and C. Um, so let me graduate now to the uh, epsilon multiple or epsilon epsilon bar. The, clearly, they are just related by CPT. In a Lagrangian field theory, these are objects of the form phi to the r, and actually, in our conventions, remember, in our conventions, r of phi bar is plus <coughs> one and r of phi minus one. Uh, so where phi is a complex scale that belongs to n equal to vector multiplet. And so this is what we identified in the context of Lagrange field theories as the gauge invariant operator whose vent parameterizes the Coulomb branch. Um, more abstractly, if we are just handed a abstract super conformal field theory where we know that we have a certain list of epsilon multiplet and necessarily by CPT the list of epsilon bar has to be the same, we will identify that list with the Coulomb chiral ring. Okay, so we're going to Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Can you repeat? Uh, Yes. Yes. This is a trace. Oh, okay. <laughs> OK. Sorry. Um, so remember, we identified the Coulomb branch. Uh, well, let me put it this way. We, we, we decide that the coordinate ring of the Coulomb branch is the Coulomb chiral ring. Now, in this con abstract context, what well, this means, we, we take the lowest component of this multiple, let's say the epsilon bar, which are the one that we call chiral. These are n equal 1 chiral. So let me write it in words. The bottom components of epsilon bar r are chiral fields. And by the usual argument, they have a regular operator product expansion, so they can be brought on top to each other without paying any price. And so the operator product expansion, in this case, defines a multiplication. And so we have the structure of a ring. And that ring is identified with the, with the ring of holomorphic functions of the Coulomb branch. Now, in all Lagrangian examples, and you see this very clearly here, that ring is freely generated. So you tell me the list of generators, for, for example, for SUN gauge group, this index R goes from 1 from 2 to n. And then this set of operators form a set of generators. And by taking arbitrary linear combinations of arbitrary products of those generators, you get the full ring. There are no relations. Till a few uh, months ago, I would have conjectured that this is the general situation in an abstract n equal to 2 superconform field theory. I would conjecture that the chiral 
ring of the Coulomb branch is always freely generated. Recently, a set of counterexamples was, uh, was provided, uh, but those counterexamples, um, in my opinion, are still a little bit cheap. So how are those counterexamples obtained? You start from a known theory and you perform a certain quotient. You perform a discrete gauging, which simply amounts in four dimensions at the level of the local operator algebra to focusing on a subset of the original operator algebra. Now, if you do that, even if the original uh, coulomb kyler ring was freely generated by this process of quotienting, you will find a different ring where there will be artificially induced relations. It's not clear to me whether that counterexample is the only kind of counterexample to this conjecture, namely any time you see a chiral ring which is not free generated, that means that truly you're just talking about a quotient theory and the mother theory had this uh, ring which was not free generated or whether this is pointing towards the fact that this conjecture is true more general, is false more general. Okay, so epsilon 2 or ep and, ep and, and its partner epsilon 2 bar are special because their top components are the exact marginal n equal to 2 preserving the formation. of the superconformal field theory. So let this, let's illustrate this in the Lagrangian example. If I start with trace phi squared and hit this with q to the fourth, I find trace f squared plus some other things. And similarly, if I act uh, with q tilde to the fourth on trace phi bar, I will try trace f dual square plus other things. So we simply recognize that the top components, so first of all, you cannot go any further because of the shortening condition. So the top components of these multiplets are the familiar kinetic term for the theory. And so we recognize that adding this deformation to the Lagrangian is simply the same thing as, so changing, so adding q to the four trace phi squared with a coupling tau plus tau bar q tilde to the four trace phi bar square is simply amounts to changes in the coupling. Okay. And one can now can argue based on this intuition one can argue this more generally. The top component of the epsilon 2 and epsilon bar 2 multiplets are always exactly marginal deformation that preserve the full unequal to 2 supersymmetry. symmetry. Well, the fact that they preserve the full unequal to 2 supersymmetry symmetry is clear from the fact that these are top components. So the moment I hit this with another Q or with another Q tilde, I get, a, I get either zero on the nose or a total derivative. And when I integrate this, so if I call this O4, and I call this O4 bar, then the D4x integral of delta tau O4 plus delta tau bar O4 bar uh, is invariant under the full equal to 2 supersymmetry. The dimension is 4, so this looks marginal on the nose. And with a little bit of extra arguing that I don't have time to do right now, one can actually rigorously prove that the formation is not only marginal to leading order, but remains exactly marginal to all orders. And the vice versa is also true. The only n equal to 2 preserving exactly marginal deformation of a superconformal field theory must be top components of the epsilon 2 and epsilon bar 2 multiplets. And so we learn at first a little lesson that if we are handed this superconformal field theory abstractly, we just look at the list of operators, count the number of epsilon 2s, and that tells us the dimension of the conformal manifold. Remember, the conformal manifold is the, the, is the, mani is the manifold of exact marginal deformation of the theory. It's a complex manifold, as clear from our whole formalism, and we just count the number of epsilon 2 that tells the dimension of the conformal manifold. Now, 
in principle, one could have isolated superconformal field theories, where, by definition, an isolated superconformal field theory is a, is a fixed point that doesn't have any exact marginal deformation. It should be clear from the discussion so far that if the theory has a Lagrangian description, then there are no isolated superconformal field theories with the trivial exception of a collection of free hypermultiplets. Just from the way we constructed the theory, we took a bunch of free hypermultiplets, added gauge fields, but necessarily each of the uh, simple vectors of the gauge group comes with a tau, and so necessarily the moment you have a non-trivial Lagrangian, you have exactly marginal deformation, which are the gauge couplings. Clear enough? OK, now we graduate to the behats. These are the Higgs operators. In a Lagrangian theory, these are gauge invariant in a Lagrangian, these are gauge invariant combinations of Q's and Q tildes. OK, so we have to be a little bit precise. Given that the SU2R is a non-abelian group, the, we really need to specify which particular uh, member of the SU2R multiplet we are considering. But that's implicit in our whole formalism. When we say we start from the superconformal primary, we're also implying that this uh, primary is annihilated according to convention by the raising or the lowering operator of SU2R. So we take the primary to be in the top component of SU2R, the highest weight of SU2R, which is implicit in our formalism again, because remember that by definition, by our, by our choice of conventions, Q and Q tilde both carry the plus value of the SU2R charge. They are conjugate to carry minus a half. <laughs> and so combination of Q and Q tilde from an equal one point of view are again chiral operators. So I can repeat the same words as before. Their operator product expansion is not singular, so we have a ring multiplication. However, unlike the Coulomb branch case, the ring is now non-trivial. If you did the exercise I asked you to do with this you one quivered of uh, a finite D type, you, would have, you should have found that there are interesting algebraic varieties where you have a ring with a set of generators that obey non trivial relations and non trivial ring multiplication. We will see examples later on. Now, B hat one, so again, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not repeating the same words because it's clear. Again, in an abstract setting, we're going to identify the coordinate ring of the Higgs branch with, with the Higgs chiral ring, which again is the ring uh, that corresponds with bottom component to the superconformal primary of the B hat R time multiplets. OK, so B hat 1 is special. So the primary is our friend the moment map operator, which in a Lagrangian theory takes the form Q Q tilde. It's an operator with E equal to 2 and R equal to 1. And then if you go down the multiplet, you will find a conserved current, which should be identified as the flavor current of the superconformal field theory. So generally, the, the, the theory will have a flavor group that commutes by definition of flavor group. It has to commute with the superconformal algebra. And so everything here will be in the adjoint, <coughs> index of this flavor group. Again. The fact that this is a conserved current for, follow from representation theory, this is an operator which is vector-like and is exactly dimension 3. It's obtained by acting with Q, Q tilde on mu. 
and so it must be conserved. And I started to say the other time, and then I was interrupted by the bell, that this is the only way we can fit a conserved current into a multiplet of the anechoic to super conformal algebra, with a small exception. The small exception So if a conserved current, current which is which commutes with the super conformal algebra, and so in particular it doesn't carry any R indices, must be Q Q tilde of the moment map with the exception of a market that was a little earlier on the board, which is C hat 0, 1 half, 1 half. If you look at its quantum numbers, you recognize that the superconformal primate of this object is indeed a, a current of dimension 3. And so why am I not uh, including this in the list of possibilities? Well, because of what I said earlier. This multiplet is a higher spin multiple in the sense that if you go up in its Q expansion, necessarily contain a conserved current of spin higher than two. So this is disallowed in a fully interacting superconformal field theory. But keep also in mind the picture that I had in my first lecture where the superconformal manifold is this manifold with cusps. The cusps are free field points. And so as we go towards one of those cusps, we gain a uh, decoupled free set. Those in particular, we may gain higher spin conserved currents. And so at those points, it may very well happen that you have enhanced symmetry group because one of these multiples can just come back to you. And as you move away from the cusp, this gadget will recombine with our short multiple to become a long multiple. This putative conserved current acquires anomalous dimensions. So away from that free field point, this is gone. There's a question. Um, there are also D-type multiples. There multiple There's a lot of multiples that I love, but <laughs> I, I, I try to stick to, <laughs> to the basic ones. Okay. Uh, we, can, we can have a private conversation about the D-multiple. There's then there's the B multiplets. They contain all sorts of good stuff, but I'm just trying to give. Or this is already, I think, elaborate enough. So I'm trying to give a slightly stri streamlined presentation. Yes. They have non-singular OPs. Okay. So the question is, why do chiral operators have non-singular OP? That just follows from the shortening condition. So their conformal dimension is equal to some conserved charge in some units. And given that the conserved charge must add up, it's clear that the, the dimension of whatever comes in is greater or equal than the charges. And so in particular, the leading non-singular term, the leading, sorry, the leading non-zero term is just another chiral operator. There are additional terms that just vanish at the coincidence point. Thank you. Please do like him and ask questions. Uh, okay, so so let's um, uh, I want to make another point about B hat one, which is the following. I discussed in the first lecture this painful story of how you write down a Lagrangian in explicit n equal one formalism, and I could have done it in component, etc. I want to now advocate a more, slightly more streamlined approach of how you, one should really have done it from the get-go, which is in a more n equal to 2 covariant language. And the idea is that the n equal to 2 vector multiplet has a natural n equal to 2 superspace formulation. I'm not going to give you details. I just want to look at basic quantum numbers. So apart from the usual theta alphas, 
we are going to introduce another set of theta, so we may as well put an index i. i is 1 and 2, and then there is a corresponding conjugate theta bar that we have in this alpha dot. And then in terms of these gadgets, one can write a big fat phi, which is our friend phi the n equal 1 chiral field, which contains <coughs> um, the lambda 2 operators. And then there is a theta 2 alpha w alpha. OK? So this is now a chiral field in this larger superspace where I introduce thetas for both the, for both the supercharges. In that language, you will encounter at some point here a combination where we contract the alpha and beta indices, and then we have auxiliary fields Fij, which are in the triplet of the art symmetry. From an n equal 1 perspective, these are really the same as our friends F, F bar, and D. But now we write them as an SU2 R triplet. And then in this language, we could write down an integral of a half of superspace. Now this is n equal to 2 superspace, so this is half of tau and a function of this big fat phi, which is called the prepotential. And now given that we're integrating over half a superspace, this is a holomorphic formalism plus a complex function. OK, I don't want to disclose what's below here. So um, let me perhaps go here by continuity. And then if one, OK, for the hypermultiple, unfortunately, there is no such nice compact way to write things in uh, n equal to superspace, because things are nice. You, have, you need to introduce infinitely many auxiliary fields. But morally, morally, the story is that in order to couple the n equal to 2 vector multiplet to matter, to hypermultiplets, what you're going to do is minimal coupling, the usual story, except in an n equal to 2 covariant fashion. And the way to do it is to write something like a coupling of the moment map, our friend the moment map. Remember the moment map is a triplet of SU2R. And contract that with our n equal to 2 triplet of auxiliary fields. OK? So this minimal coupling will take in some version of superspace a form like this. We're coupling the vector part, which contains the triple auxiliary fields, with the moment map. And this, of course, should be understood in a superspace version, meaning that as you keep hitting this with Qs, eventually here, you will encounter the conserved current. Among, other, among all the terms that you will find here, there will be the term that couples the conserved current with the gauge field. Am I making sense? OK, so why am I telling you these things? Because we can now free ourselves from this really limiting Lagrangian perspective and things more abstractly. Suppose you hand me a super conformal field here with a certain Fravel group. And I want to gauge it. How would I go about it? Well, I would take this abstract multiplet, the moment map multiplet, which among other things contain this conserved current, and couple it to a bunch of free vectors. And minimal coupling in the usual way will give me a formalism, which is a little bit hybrid. I have a black box, which is given to me abstractly. And I only know that there is a conserved current multiplet, the moment map multiplet. And then I have the free vector multi, which I described with the Lagrangian, and I, and I write a coupling of this form between this abstract conserved current and the gauge fields. OK, so I can do that. And in that language, I can also rewrite the condition for the vanishing of the beta function. And the point is the following, that that j nu 
comes with a flavored central charge, K, which is defined because, which is well defined because remember J mu is a current, so if I take uh, the usual integral of the zeroth component, I find the charge. And given that we're talking about non-abelian groups, because remember, for you one groups, the beta function is always positive. We are not interested in those. Given that there's a non-abelian group here, the normalization of the charges is fixed by the structure constant of the algebra. I cannot mess with that. And so the normalization of J is fixed. And then its two-point function comes with a specific normalization, which I'm going to call K. Okay, J mu, J nu will be, you know, I'm not going to write. There is a structure of uh, dependence on x and y, which is completely fixed by conformal invariance, and there's a normalization k. So this, given this object dimension <laughs> 6, this is something that is roughly of the form, you know, g mu nu minus 2x mu x nu, whatever it is. There is l let me not write it. There's a structure of indices. Let me write it very schematically, 1 over x to the 6. But there is a well-defined normalization coefficient in some, norm in some well prescribed normalization that defines the flavor central charge k. We can also understand this as a Toft anomaly. As a, uh, and so this is a well-defined object, which is in particular invariant uh, on the conformal manifold. And then in terms of that k, if we gauge uh, so the, the beta one, the coefficient of the one loop beta function would be 2hv minus k over 2. For comparison, we recall that for full hyper multiplets, compare this with the answer for full hyper, which was like this. So, so we learned that in the specific Lagrangian case, k is equal to 4 times C2R, but this is now a more abstract way to think about the gauge. OK, questions about this? Yes? Sorry? Irrational. No, there are no such examples. I would think not, but I don't have a proof. Yes? Only, only if, only if k, that's what I wrote here. In the Lagrangian example, yes, you can compute k in terms of some group theory uh, uh, that has to do with the underlying representation to which they ha they have a multiple transform. But more abstractly, you're just given this current algebra and you just know the value of k. OK, so let me now draw this picture of the conformal manifold again. Absolutely. So the, uh, the question, Oliver, is if you don't have the Lagrangian representation theory, see what it is. Absolutely. Except that I don't, like to look, I don't get to look under the hood and, and ask what is the representation of the elementary building blocks. The point, you see, the, the point is the following, that the, in the Lagrangian example, let's do, for example, the case of uh, some, uh, some super QCD theory. So we formed some gauge single combination, then we have IJ. So this is the moment map for the U and F flavored symmetry. And then if I know that that U and F adjoint object came from combining fundamental and anti-fundamental, I, con I compute its K by using the formula I have earlier in terms of C2 of the fundamental representation. But, but if I'm, all I'm given is this abstract object, I don't know that this is a composite operator of the fundamental representation times the anti-fundamental. There's no such formula. I just have to compute k more abstract. OK, so with these preliminaries, we can now go back at this picture, the conformal manifold. There are singular points. These are cusps with enhanced higher sim symmetry and perhaps in enhanced global symmetries, as I emphasized earlier. And as we move away from these points, we're in the middle of the conformal manifold. 
and k, c, and a are constant that can be argued using the fact that they can be related to Toft anomalies. Um, the, there's another interesting thing that we can argue. I argue that at the, the special points you can have enhanced global symmetry coming from higher spin multiplets. However, the true legitimate flavored symmetry of the theory, the one that is the one that you have anywhere infinitesimally away from the cast, the one that comes to the b hat 1, b hat 1 content is also invariant. And that can be argued by looking at the structure of the recombination rules for the n equal to superconformal algebra. Remember, I emphasize this point. I, I didn't really emphasize this point. I said it very quickly. Let me emphasize it now. You list the multiplets of your theory at some point on the conformal manifold. Some of them are short, some of them are long. And you ask yourself, how does the multiple content changes as I move around? Well, the long multiplets, of course, their dimension is not protected, so it changes in some complicated way. What about the short multiplets? But naively, you'd say, well, since they are short, their uh, energies, their conformal dimension is just fixed by the shortening condition. But that's too fast. And the, the reason this is too fast is that it can happen that a long multiplet, as you reach a special point on the conformal manifold, it hits its unitarity bound, and then it decomposes into a sum of short multiplets. Or vice versa, if you want to think about the reverse, you may have a precisely carefully arranged list of short multiplets such that they can form the combination uh, that corresponds precisely to a long multiple threshold, and then at that point, it's allowed for, for that combination to acquire anomalous dimension. So we have to be aware of this phenomenon, which is ubiquitous in, in uh, intersubsymmetric field theories, <laughs> that what is really well defined is something like a Witten index, which accounts for this phenomenon of recombination. In, in, the, in the story of the Witten index, you look at the vacua, and you count the number of vacuum with a minus 1 to the f, that is invariant. And the analog here, you have to count the short multiplets up to the equivalence relation that sets to 0 uh, direct sums of multiples that can form a, sh a long multiple. Nevertheless, if you look at the recombination rules for the superconformal algebra, you see that b hat 1 never appears in the decomposition of a long multiplet. So b, b hat 1 is what is called an absolutely protected multiplet. If you know you have a BH1, you know it, you're going to have it forever because it can never recombine with other things to become long. Epsilon R content is also invariant for the same reason. The epsilon multiplets never partake to recombination rules. And so the structure of the Coulomb branch, meaning the number generated to the current branch of their dimension is completely invariant on the conformal manifold. There was a, a little bit of terminology that I introduced earlier, which is we define the rank of a superconformal field theory as the number of generators of its Coulomb chiral ring. So among other things, the rank of the superconformal field theory is an invariant of superconformal manifold. OK, great. So basically, that, that's now where. We're now finally starting to do business. I've introduced a lot of definitions and a lot of uh, background material. And we can now start looking at non-trivial examples. Yes, question? So, the two R's, uh, you said, like, they're absolutely protected, right? Yes. And, I mean, if, for example, you have a Lagrangian phase of phi to k, it is, like, the quiet quantum correction. But the claim is that, like, you can still write down the whole OK, there are, there are, OK, so the question is, uh, what about, so I told, I said the epsilon R multiple are absolutely protected. What about the familiar fact to some of you that the Coulomb branch has an interest in quantum corrections because of the Witten geometry and all of that? Well, that's a very different story. Okay, so I'm thinking about sitting at a superconformal point, so the VEVs of all the operators are zero, and moving in the conformal manifold, which is the manifold of exactly marginal deformation of the theory. You're thinking about the opposite. You want to sit, fix the coupling, and give a VEV to the operators, which moves you away from the superconformal point. So there's no contradiction. 
Okay, great. So, okay. So with these preparations, have a, have, have a, have, having developed this whole formal machinery, do we re do we have any examples of theory that do not have any simple Lagrangian description? Of course, the answer is a resounding yes. And to start organizing this huge landscape of, of possibilities that we have uncovered in the last three years. Well, there are many ways you could cut, cut and slice it. A possible way, which for pedagogical reasons I'm going to follow, is to organize the theories by rank. Okay, I told you the rank is the dimension of the, of the Coulomb branch. Rank, that's how we rank zero, theories with no Coulomb branch. It's widely believed. So, let's now go this way. This is the dimension of the Coulomb branch. Rank zero, it's widely believed, but there's no proof. And eventually, the booster program will provide such a proof, but we're not ready yet. But the only possibility is, is a collection of free hypermultiplets. Well, obviously, if you just have three hypermultiplets, there are no phi, so there is no Coulomb branch. That's kind of trivial. But we haven't found in the wild any exotic example of a theory which has no Coulomb branch, and it's not a bunch of free hypers. And, well, I think there are strong intuitive reasons to think that, that such a thing cannot exist, and I'm just going to say that it's a conjecture. Um, conjecture. Now, for rank one, on the other hand, there is a rather large list of theories of the order of 20. And um, there is a classification program, which I think has been more or less completed, uh, pioneered by Philippe Argires, Mario Martone, and their collaborators, which is to classify using cyber width and geometry. Well, the idea is the following. So here, I really, I'm really going to be extraordinarily brief. <laughs> but there are many good reviews on the subject. So I'm going to give you the shortest possible introduction to cyber width and theory. The idea is to explore the consistency conditions on the theory that come from giving an expectation value to, so to the, in this case, to the unique uh, Coulomb branch generator. Okay, so we have a parameter u, which is going to be the value of our epsilon r. Recall, many of you uh, probably have studied cyber Witten theory. Recall that this is generalization of the famous definition of the U parameter. And so we started the U plane, it's a complex plane U. The origin of the U plane at a classical level is where the superconformity theory lives. And we then look at the low energy effective action at on the U-plane. And on general grounds, what this will be is a theory of a single massless U1. It will be a massless U1 vector multiplet. Okay, in the Lagrangian example, you can understand this rather easily. We give an expectation value of phi that breaks the S2 gauge group to U1, and we look at the low energy effective action of this U1. And more generally, it's kind of obvious that 
given that I have this moduli space of vacia, it costs no energy in moving from one point to the one next to it. So it must be that the Lorange effective action contains a master degrees of freedom transformed in the n equal to two vector multiple representation. So just on the same end that the Coulomb branch is one dimensional, on very abstract grounds, you know that the Lorange effective action must be given by a, the action of a one vector multi with two derivative p's and then higher derivative correct. So now the formalism I had earlier with this prepotential comes in handy because we can we can use this prepotential. So let's call let's so we have now this let's say let's call a the lowest component of this u1 vector multiplet which again contains gauge enos and then eventually the gauge field and so we write this prepotential f of a uh, d4 theta this is this uh, and equal to two superspace formalism. Now, if you compare that formalism with the n equal one expression that we wrote in the first lecture, you can. So now we are in the Coulomb branch, and so this object is really acquiring an expectation value compared to the Lagrangian case. In the Lagrangian case, we think of a as the expectation value of five. So A provides some local coordinate on the Coulomb branch, which is just a local holomorphic coordinate, whereas U is a globally defined thing. And in terms of this lo global, this locally defined coordinate, tau of A in this rank one case is just the double derivative of F with respect to A. And then we can also rewrite this as A D, which is subscript that involves dual, with respect to A, where we have simply defined, there's nothing deep here, we just define AD as the FDA. Okay? And when we, we can also write the killer potential in terms of A in A dual, and the killer potential takes the form, now the killer potential function of A in A bar, and it's something like up to a sign A dual A star minus a dual star a okay so for uh, those who know something and uh, if even for those who don't know it this is the structure of special killer geometry the killer potential is not generic but it's constrained to to have this more specialized form where we have this holomorphic coordinates a and a dual that obey certain consistent conditions for example, imaginary part of tau in order for it to be consistent has to be positive because that's a gauge coupling, etc. And this just follows from the structure of an equal to supersymmetry. Now the main point is, is that we travel in this U plane, uh, we must encounter singularity. That's easy to show. If you have this structure which is forced up upon you by an equal to supersymmetry and everywhere the situation was smooth, you quickly find that the theory is trivial. And the singularities have the interpretation of points in the U-plane where additional, mass ad the additional degrees of freedom become massless. That typically is the case that simulates the breakdown of your low energy effective field theory. Your low energy effective field becomes bad there. And, um, and what happens is that this description in terms of these local uh, special killer coordinates is only varied locally but not globally because you forgot to take into account the intrinsic ambiguity that we have in defining a U1 uh, abelian gauge field which is the possibility of a Latin magnetic duality. So it turns out that there really is an ambiguity there's a global ambiguity where we can redefine a dual and A, and similarly tau, if you check that this is induces the standard transformation on tau, where this is an SL2Z 
transformation. Okay. So the way we should really think about this, we have this fiber of A in a dual defined at each point on this plane, but the fiber is an, defines a non-trivial SL to Z bundle, such that we, when we go around this with these singular points, we may acquire a non-trivial SL to Z monotony. Okay, so basically that's the story. Wh once you have this formalism in place, beautifully Cyber Witten argued that the situation is so constrained by the fact that the monotony at infinity is controlled by perturbative gauge theory because when the wave is very large, you're in the perturbative regime, and then you make very plausible assumption about the structure of the singularities, and you do this really unique way to make sense of the whole story, and that solves for you the entire Lorange effective action. A more global way to think about this is to think, rather than, than introducing this A and A dual, we can think more intrinsically in terms of the complex structure of an auxiliary torus, because after all, the fact that tau is defined up, up to SL to Z transformation means that we should think about it as the complex structure module of a torus. So we, think we can think that each fiber, really we have a little torus, and we're looking at this vibration of the torus over the U-plane, and we can, in fact, write down very explicitly each of these elliptic curves in, in the virus form, you know, it's the usual story we write. This plus f of u x plus g of u. And so as we vary u, we are, fi we are looking at how this fiber varies over the u-plane. So this is, of course, the cyber witten curve, which must be equipped with an additional one-form meromorphic form lambda which is such that its period integrals over the cyber witten curve give the A and A dual local holomorphic coordinates. Okay, that is my seven minutes introduction to cyber witten theory. Questions about that? I don't know, probably if you hadn't seen it before, it didn't make a whole lot of sense, but that's a, as quickly as I can say without being completely incoherent. I just wanted to give you a flavor for what is done. Now, what is the point? Well, the point is we have this geometric structure, and what uh, Martona and Argeus have done is to look at all possible consistent geometries of this type that satisfy a variety of consistency conditions that come from physics. Okay? And so that le leads to a classification of putative. Uh, rank one of, I should say, of candidate geometries that could be associated to a rank one superconformal field theory. The fact that you have found a cyber witten geometry doesn't necessarily mean that there is a superconformal field theory, but perhaps it's a good indication that there might be one. Okay, is, this, is the logic clear? Okay, so one thing which is actually very easy to do is to look at the scale invariant case. Okay, so here I didn't say it in words, but of course, famously, Cyber Witten, their fa original paper, they did for the case of pure SU2, which is not a conformal field theory, it's a simple field theory, and then they added flavor in their second paper. So this story can be done, in fact, should be done in full generality. It, not only you have the superconformal fixed point, but you should consider all possible relevant deformations, such as mass deformations. And it's very, so here implicitly, actually, this F and U also depend on mass deformations. And so you really should try the cyber width and geometry for arbitrary choice of the relevant holomorphic deformations. But if we want to do a first analysis of the problem, we can just stick to the point where we switch off all the relevant deformations and we're looking at, at the superconformal field theory and ask how would the cyber width and geometry of that scale invariant theory look like? Well, the idea is that necessarily then the U-plane must look like a cone because we have an action of the scale transformation on this plane. So it really must look like a plane with a single singularity at the origin. If you had two singularities, then their distance would define a scale. 
So the only possibility that you have a single singularity at the origin, which is the point where the superconformal field theory lives, but you should allow for the possibility of a non-trivial deficit angle for the theory. And in fact, you can relate the deficit angle theta to the dimension of, in my conventions, I should call it E, the conformal dimension of U, relates in this fashion to the deficit angle. And there is a very famous classification of possible ways in which an elliptic fiber can degenerate and still leads to a consistent geometry, which is due to Kodaira. And so, actually, there's a very limited number of possibilities for the scaling dimension of U, which is really fixed by the Kodaira classification. So the only possibilities <coughs> are the following. E of U can be 6, 4, 3, 2, 3 halves, 4 thirds, or 6 fifths. But what is U? U is the di dimension of the chiral operator whose web parameterizes the Coulomb branch, so it's the R charge of our epsilon R operator. So this is actually very interesting. From pure thought, or little more than it, we can classify the possible values. So remember, we have a one-dimensional Coulomb branch, so there's a un unique epsilon R multiplet. Is R arbitrary? Not at all. R is one of these values. Okay. However, we're not quite done. If it was that simple, then we would have just immediately listed the possibilities. But I told you earlier that the cyber witten geometry is more involved because there are possible mass deformations, etc. So now, when it, when it actually gets hard, and that's why, that's why Mario and Philip wrote many papers on this, is to class, given a choice of Kodaira dimension, you have to classify all possible ways in which you can deform the singularity adding masses, for example, and masses are related to the flavor symmetry of the theory, as I will explain momentarily in a little bit more detail. And if you consider the most general deformation, you find a very sprawling, in fact, infinite list that doesn't make sense. And so you have to start imposing more stringent conditions. For example, what happens to the geometry under RG flow, where the singularity will split? Are all possible splitting allowed? No, because some, some of the splitting gives something which is inconsistent in the IR. And under a certain set of reasonable physical assumptions, you can now go ahead and classify all possible deformations of the Kodai of these <laughs> basic scale invariant geometries and get to a list of 20 or so candidate cyber witten geometries that could describe superconformal field theories. And I believe that all of them up to perhaps a couple whose status is a little unclear to me, since Philip and Mario did their work, have been identified in the while, constructed by alternative physical means. OK, so that's a general strategy <coughs> of how we, co we classify rank one superconformal field theories by looking at the consistent condition of their cyber width and geometry. Are there questions about this? Yes? Um, okay, let me first repeat the question. It's a little bit of an uh, advanced question, so I, I think I'm going to postpone it. But the question was, uh, before we start colliding singularities, we get things like Argyres, daggers, etc. We just have uh, either U1 in the infrared or SU2 with an F greater than 4. That's all true. But this is not quite the philosophy I'm following here. What you have in mind is the solution say, that cyber witten gave for SU2 with, say, one flavor. And then you want to start colliding singularities there. Here, the viewpoint is a little bit reversed. I don't start with any Lagrangian example. I just want to classify the abstract geometry. And so I first, I start with this cone with a definite deficit angle that Kodaira classified for me. And now I ask how, ca I, how I can deform it in the sense of adding mass deformations to it. This is different from the collision of singularity that you find in the GSDR. Somewhat different. 
unless it's really urgent, let's pos this is a, you are, the question is a little bit too advanced for my train of thoughts right now. Okay, so now it's time for some disclosure. Although I'm not presenting the full list of, uh, of rank one theories, this is a nice little set that has been known for a long time. And these are the theories that correspond to the maximal flavor deformation of the Codile singularities. Okay, so the, these are the theories that, for given choice of the deficit angle of the cone, have the highest possible flavored symmetry. You see there's one representative for each for each of the Codaira values, which are here, the last column is the value of a little r. And these theories are classified by a choice of Lie algebra as well. A0 just means a trivial Lie algebra. A1 is SU2, A2 is SU3, and then D4 is SO8, E6, E7, and E8. You can look up the dual Coxeter number HV all the algebra, and you see that rather beautifully, all the physical parameters of the theory, from little r to the value of the A anomaly to the value of the C anomaly to the value of the uh, of the flavored central charge have very simple linear relation in terms of HV. It's very uniform. So these theories have flavored symmetry, which corresponds to the name of the algebra. So this theory has no flavored symmetry, SU2, SU3, SO8, E6, 7, and E8, with these values of K, with these values of C, and these values of A. So I should say that in this case, many of these theories were known long ago. In particular, these theories were, when, were found by Minahan and Nemenshansky. Well, what they really found was the subway witten geometry. And then these theories were identified by taking certain four-dimensional uh, compatifications. They, they were obtained somewhat indirectly, starting from higher dimensional field theories and compatifying them to four dimensions. Well, this theory is our old friend. Well, it's not really our friend yet because we haven't I haven't told you much about it, but this is the SU2 theory with an f equal to 4. It will become our friend shortly. And these three theories, they have come up, somebody mentioned their name, these are Gilles Douglas theories. They were originally obtained in the way that somebody mentioned by starting from the cyber witten solution for say SU2 gauge theory with one, two, and three flavor, and looking at various singular points in the U plane where you simultaneously tune U and tune the, tune the masses in such a way that at that particular point you find simultaneous electric and magnetic recharged ions. And then, in fact, the way you originally found by Argyris Douglas was in the solution for pure SU3. And then it was recognized that A0 which is the basic Argyris Douglas theory that appears in the basic Argyris Douglas example, also appears by doing a certain fine tuning in SU2 with one flavor. A1 appears in fine tuning SU2 with two flavors, and A2 appears in fine tuning SU2 with three flavors. So these three first three four theories have something that, in some sense, have a four dimension, nice four dimensional interpretation because the, the first three can be obtained by taking certain singular limits of Lagrangian theories. The fourth is a Lagrangian theory on the nose, and the last three are more mysterious. Yes? No, it is not. So these are the maximally allowed flavor <laughs> symmetry deformations of the basic Kodaira cone. There are many more elaborate possibilities that have reduced flavor symmetry. There are possibilities, but not, uh, not uh, with the, the right values of HV. Well, at least not, well, of all people, I love them. What was that last question? Some of these people know a lot, know a lot. and so some people identify that two, two things are missing here. G2 and F4. Why are they missing? Because if I include G2 and F4, this is, becomes a very famous list of Lie algebras, which was identified by the Lin as having special representation theoretic properties. So the Lin series, which in fact was before the Lin was found by Sivitanovich, so it really should be called the 
the lynch Vitanovich series also includes G2 and F4, but G2 and F4 are not in the Kodaira list. So there's a certain clash between Kodaira and the Lin. Okay? Now, a more uniform physical presentation of the whole sequence, and this I'm, I'm going to say some words that makes, will make sense to some of you, but no sense to some other of you, come from F theory. You take a single D3 brain and you place it at an, a, an F theory singularity, and this is the classification of F theory singularities are certain non perturbative collection of the seven brains. That's how you could think about them. This one is special, this is just four D7 brains, and, and it has a perfectly good per, uh, description in perturbative string theory. The others are realized non perturbative in F theory. So these are the rank one. I should give the, give, call, give the name. These are the rank one because it's a single D3 brains. So 1D3, F theory, superconformal field theories. OK, so I will not have time today to, to discuss the Higgs branch of these theories. But let me just say the following. From this picture that this is a single D3 brain probing a bunch of the seven brains, we immediately know what their Higgs branch is. And that's because a D3 brain dissolves into a D7 brain to give rise to an instant. And so the Higgs branch of this theory is the instant of moduli space, one instant on because you have a single D3 brain, of this appropriate gauge algebras. OK, so for example, for the A1 theory, we're talking about the SU2 one instant of moduli space. That's the Higgs branch of the theory. OK. So the E theories are good candidates, but all to their GS Douglas theories, but these ones are examples of isolated non Lagrangian superconformal field theories. You see the Coulomb branch as a single epsilon r with r equal 3, 4, and 6. So there is no epsilon 2, which means there's no exactly marginal operator, which means these are isolated. This is an exception, but because, of course, this is SU2 gauge group with, with fourth flavor, so this is indeed the Lagrangian field theory, where epsilon 2 is identified as trace phi square. It's the gauge coupling. OK. How am I doing? OK, so now let's um, familiarize ourselves a little bit more with these theories. First of all, in common parlance, our Gilles Douglas field theories are any uh, n equal to superconformal field theory with fractional values of u and r, regardless of whether or not they come from taking values, colliding of singularities or whatnot. It's why the, well, there's an argument that appeared recently in a series of here by Cecotti and also by uh, Martone and Argyris, that the R charges are always rational in n equal to superconformal field theories. And I believe the same is true for the A and C charges and also for K. This is to be contrasted with n equal 1, where these values can be algebraic, as can explain to you, and presumably n equal to 0, anything goes. So there's this nice. Well, n equal to 4, everything is an integer. So this is nice hierarchy of niceness. So um, OK, what's next? So just like as I told you a little bit about, let's familiarize ourselves a little bit more with this canonical Lagrangian example. So it's four hypermultiplets in the SU2 representation. So a priori, I could describe them as QAI Q tilde A i, where A goes from 1 to 2, it's an SU2 gauge, and i 1 to 4 is the is the uh, flavor index. However, because SU2 is pseudo real, what I really should be doing to exhibit the full flavored symmetry of the theory is to use the epsilon tensor to convert these indices here. And then what I really should be treating this is for eight half hypers, QA, well, let me use, it, well, let's call, let's call it M, 
QAM, where M runs from 1 to 8. OK, is this clear? Now, naively, the flavored symmetry would then be U8, because I could, real, I could rotate these things. But that clashes with the superpotential. Right? The superpotential, remember, the superpotential has the form phi Q, uh, QT. Well, in this language, I write languages as in this way. And so actually, only an SO8 is allowed. So the theory has an SO8 flavored symmetry. SO8 is, of course, the same as D4. And so that agrees with our F theory realization. Now, Seibert and Witten famously found the curve for this theory. We have a UV parameter, UV, not to be confused with tau of A, which is the coupling on the local coupling on the U plane. And so if we form the combination Q epsilon 2 pi i tau u, uh, the curve will depend on the form. OK, so, okay, so this is another point I really should explain. There are four mass parameters. Four happens to be the rank of SO8. OK, this is not a coincidence. So let me, OK, so. Let me explain this quickly. The mass deformations are into one to one, uh, one to one correspondent with the Cartan of the flavor group. This can be argued very generally. So what are mass deformations? In abstract language, mass deformations are a different type of top component of the moment map. If I take Q square mu, let me write it precisely. I have mu ij, and I now want to take a combination where, well, mu ij down, let's say, this combination is now a three-dimensional operator, which is a top component, because on the shortening condition of mu, it turns out that you cannot add any more q or q tilde by either by finding 0 or a derivative. And this object, in the Lagrangian language, if you write it out, it's a fermion mass term, which is linear in the mass, scale that should arise at the next order, order m squared. But now, of course, I can do this very abstractly. The moment the theory is a flavored symmetry, I can write down a relevant n equal to 2 preserving deformation of this, of this type. And a priori, you could say, well, who can stop me from, I have this mu which sits in this beautiful adjoint representation. Why can't I do a deformation where I turn on an arbitrary mass in the adjoint representation? Why should I limit myself to the Cartan? Well, it turns out that the analysis of the consistency of n equal to supersymmetry at the second order inputs actually a condition that this matrix M of masses should commute with its conjugate. This could be understood perhaps more simply if you think of M as the expectation value of an of a n equal to 2 vector superfield. And then the condition is that phi should commute with phi bar. That it, that's a condition that it's a consistent coulomb branch deformation. So actually, only the Cartan is allowed. So there are mass deformations which are dual to the, to the Cartan generators of the flavors. OK. so. So Cyber and Witten solved the curve for us. And they found the following beautiful phenomenon, that the theory has an S-duality, which is similar. So the curve is invariant and as has to z provided one performs a triality rotation
of SO8, which in this context correspond to a certain permutation of the Cartan generators of SO8. So if you do that, you find that the fundamental domain is this. If you insist, as you perhaps should do, in treating the theory for arbitrary masses, you say, well, wait a minute. Why should I permute the masses? The masses are what they are. Then, of course, the theory is not invariant under SL2Z, because under an SL2Z transformation, the, masses, the value of the masses get permuted. But if I work for fixed value of the masses, it is what it is. But given that triality, after all, you know, if you keep doing triality, eventually you come back to where you were, it's clear that there should be a smaller group of SL2Z under which the theory is invariant. And it turns out to be that the relevant conjugates of group is gamma 0 of 2, which is, again, A, B, C, D, where B is 0 mod 2. And you could draw the fundamental domain perhaps it's this gadget here so here I'm using conventions where tau is not the usual normalization it's one where uh, this is tau over pi plus 8 pi i over g squared so you see that tau going to tau plus 2 is a natural symmetry of the theory, just because it, it's uh, shifting the theory angle by 2 pi. And you see this theory has three cusps. Tau equal i infinity. Tau equal 1. Of course, minus 1 is the same as 1, because this line is identified with that line. And finally, tau equal to zero. Okay. Just uh, uh, to remind you, in the case of SL two Z, there's a single cusp, the one at i infinity. These two points, in fact, also th this point and this point are special. They have finite order orbifold singularity, but are not cusps. A cusp is something by which is, which is fixed by an infinite order group. In this case, if tau going to tau plus n fixes the cusp. And so that's my definition of the singularity. OK, so what is the interpretation in this language? Now, here, the masses are fixed. And the three cusps correspond to three weakly coupled limits of the theory, which are rotated into one another by triality. So each of these cusps has a Lagrangian description in terms of SO8, except that the, what you call the W bosons in one framework become dions in another framework, and it's, it's already shuffled by non-perturbative duality, which also acts non-trivially into SO8. But the theory has, if you wish, three different Lagrangian descriptions in these three limits. The Lagrangian is the same, but it's not quite the same because you have to perform this outer automorphism of SO8. And if we forget, if we turn the masses to zero, for example, if we work up to the masses, then we recover the SL to Z invariance. OK. OK, but I have to say something which is really beautiful. OK, so what is the beautiful thing that I'm going to say? So there is a very curious reinterpretation of this geometry. So the first thing that we may want to observe is that L to L to Z divided by gamma 0, 2 is S3, the group of permutation of three elements. And of course, we're all familiar with the fact that, that the fundamental domain of SL to Z is the complex structure modulus of the torus. How do we interpret gamma 0, 2? Well, gamma 0, 2 well, should I say it this way? The um, fundamental domain of gamma zero two is the 
complex moduli space of the four punctual sphere. If we treat the four punctures as distinct. Okay, if we treat them as equivalent, that's the same as saying we work up to triality and then we go back to SL2Z. And so, in fact, it's a famous story that the moduli space of the four puncture sphere if we treat the punctures as equivalent, it's the same as the moduli space of the torus. But if we do not, so we have this sphere, we have four points. Famously, we can fix three of them by SL2C, and then the position of the fourth is our modulus. And that's the precise description of the moduli space. So the three cusps correspond to the three ways in which this fourth point can approach the other three fixed points. Okay? So how do we now go back to field theory? Well, there is this curious way to represent triality, which is the following. So SO8, of course, we can split in SO4 times SO4, and then each of them is an SU2 times SU2. So we can look at this SU2 times SU2 times SU2. It's a group of SO8. And what triality does, it permutes the SU2s, it turns out. So if we parameterize masses in terms of the cartons of these embedded SU2s, what triality does is permutes them. So that suggests that what we really should be doing Rather than thinking in terms of, of this m going from 1 to 8, let's split this into the following fashion. We have four SU2s. So, well, let's do it in two stages, perhaps. First, we go to m tilde, comma, m double tilde where m tilde and m double tilde go from 1 to 4, right? So that's the splitting of SO8 and SO4 times SO4. So the right sum. And then each of these m tilde and m double tilde becomes a bifundamental of SU2, right? So this would be BC and this would be DE, where now A, B, C, D, E are all SU2 indices. Okay, so we are thinking of our original matter content. There was eight half hypermultiplets in the fundamental of SU2 as now two copies of a tri-fundamental half hypermultiplet in the SU2 of which one is gauged. So we can draw a little picture. So we represent each of these gadgets, so Q has three indices, A, well, what was it again? It was A, B, C. A is the one that is gauged. And then we have another one which is gauged, which is B and E. So that's our matter content, right? So this is, we can now, be, since it's SU2, we may as well put all the indices in the same position. Downstairs, for example, it doesn't matter. And we are gauging this gadget in this way. So we now get to rep represent our Lagrangian by this kind of equivalent diagram, where this is an SU2 gauge group. But remember, what does triality do? Triality permutes the four flavors. So what triality does is crossing symmetry. Clear enough? So S3, 
those of you who know a little bit of conformal group, is a group of Gaussian transformation of a four-point function with inequivalent external dimensions. 